present the second and third respondents. Thank you very much. Uh, let's, let's deal with uh, several preliminary issues. Is there more? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Forgive me. Another preliminary issue is Makola and I appear for the public for the community as a friend. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. I'm sorry, Mr. Gould, but I didn't hear that properly. Say it again. I appear to have a very clear Ms. Makola for the Army Post Africa Black House Collective Foundation on the instructions of RMT attentions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gould. Um, let us deal with some preliminary issues before we get to the business of the day. Uh, and that deals, first of all, with the Amicus application. Um, as I have it at the moment, although the applicant and the first respondent have expressed no uh, view, the National Prosecuting Authority has opposed the application. There appears to be a new development, Justices. Perhaps I'm looking for an NPA, 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 what is the position? Yes, this is the court. Uh, we, we are not uh, opposing the, the application. Uh, what, what does this notice of opposition I have mean? Uh, it, it, that relates to, to part B, wherein we have to uh, deal with some unfounded and malicious allegations leveled against the second and third respondent. But for part A, we, we are not opposing that. Well, I take it you've read the affidavits in the amicus application? That's correct. So how will that assist us deciding the agenda for today, which is whether or not there should be an interim entity? Well, our view is that uh, what, whatever they're raising will not uh, you know, assist the court in as far as, as, as part A is concerned. It's not, not apparent to me that you've actually applied your mind to that issue. Sorry? It's not apparent to me that you've actually applied your mind to the question I posed to you. Is the, the uh, taking for granted that the amicus's contributions are relevant to part B, what possible assistance can they offer this court, qua amicus, in deciding whether or not there should, should be an interim entity? We, we, we submit that, uh, uh, but we leave that to the court, but we submit that uh, no case has been made out in as far as, uh, as part, part A is concerned because, uh, you know, there, there's nothing that, that, uh, that they're going to, to add. All right. Well, then I think I understand you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Malavidi. Uh Back to you, Mr. Nguana. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of issues. First of all, it doesn't appear to me on the face of it that the contribution you can make to this debate um, is relevant to this particular part. Uh, what you've set out in your papers will certainly constitute a material contribution to the debate in part B. But over and above that, um, you've not sought to join the Minister of Justice, which would be a relevant step to take if you're going to challenge the constitutionality of the present arrangements concerning who is or isn't entitled to bring a private prosecution. So I would invite you to consider whether you need to amplify your papers in that regard. And our prima facie view is that you needn't participate in this particular set of proceedings, but uh, you should persist with uh, joining in part B after and with the Minister of Justice and uh, the matter can then be taken forward at that stage. And lastly, while well, I'm just putting points to you to comment on, um, reading the, uh, the thrust of several of your submissions, uh, you might want to reconsider whether you seek to join as an interested party rather than as an amicus. Uh, an, an amicus wouldn't, as your papers indicate, be expected to uh, express partisan views, which you're entitled to, and it may be that the exact status of your joinder uh, needs to be uh, refined. Thank you, Justice Sutherland. Let me start with a 
I'm, I perhaps I've uh, misstated myself. Um, I'm not addressing the question of whether or not it's appropriate for you to be part of Part B. I'm making that assumption. Um, I'm simply pointing to you at this stage is it's not apparent to us that you have a substantial contribution to make to whether or not there should be an interim interdict. Well, then, then perhaps I should then address the board on that very question. Please. Your Lordship who have um, read our heads of argument, we have prepared a note uh, um, as a court address just to limit the scope of our argument. You can hand that up. It's only 15 pages. It summarizes the case that we make yes. in our heads of argument as well as the founding of the Yes, I'd, ra I'd rather, you s rather you skip that for the moment and simply uh, directly uh, address me on, on the point I've raised. Uh, we're sitting in an urgent court. Um, with, without, without wanting to make it sound disparaging, you have sought to gate crash an urgent application. And um, that um, creates a disorderly dimension to the proceedings. Uh, whereas, on the face of it, uh, your participation in the main debate uh, will be valuable. Uh, insofar as our limited agenda today is to determine whether or not the applicants made out a case on an urgent interim interdict, it's not apparent that the scholarship which you have marshaled is relevant to address those rather well-established principles. Well, I hope that you can make the bull point in less than 20 minutes as to why you can help us on the interdict. Perhaps we can start with the punchline. Perhaps we can start with the punchline. What is it that you're going to say that Mr. Mpofu is not going to say on the interim interdict? If I can take, if you've seen our vote, I just want to take it to that point. Yes, we'll hand up the note, please. Hand up the note. Paragraph 31. Paragraph 31. Yes. We say that the first law of the nation that we have is that the facts of this case demonstrate that the requirement of the spirit of the law of the may serve as an impediment or unjustified limitation of the secondary law of the access to the law of the prosecutor. The second point is that the National Prosecuting Authority has made a stack itself without the PFA or credit. Third is the slap suit defense, which they have now been developed from the seat to be the federal side, but they no longer pursue the punitive force of order against the legal representatives. So that argument will be slightly tainted. And the fourth point relates to the um, equality of We say all these issues are canvas in great detail in our legislation. They are indeed. Uh, they are indeed. And they're all relevant to Part B. Yes, um, I'm, 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 I, I will, in due course, 
be very interested in hearing you argue all of these in the second leg of this case. But today, the only agenda in this urgent court is whether or not the applicant has made out a case for an interdict. And, 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 and if, if what you have just pointed out to me, with which I was already familiar, is the thrust of what you want to advance, I appreciate the scholarship that's gone into what you put together, but um, I do not see how that will contribute other than to lengthening the hearing uh, in dealing with whether or not there's an interim interview. Right. Just to say, I, before sitting down, it's direct you to paragraph 104 to 105. It's a case line 010-44. In whose papers are these? These are the president's papers. It's a reply again. Which Give me the page number again, please. It's a page. It's, um, well, I've got case line records. Yes, case line. That's fine. Uh, 0110, 010-44, uh, 010 at paragraphs 104 to 105. It's the point that I want to paragraph 105, and I'll be just hand it up. Where the president... <coughs> that doesn't seem to be the correct page. Paragraph 104, you said. Paragraphs 104 to 105. They cited ju a judgment. Just give me the, the page, page number again. It's 54. 010-44. Mm -hmm. Paragraphs 104. Oh, that, that's in the... That's in the... Uh, it's in the... Uh, case the flying Yes. Not, not, the, not the first hit page. Where the... The president says, and of course this is a, a trite issue, the president says his interdict application must be determined with reference to the grounds of review. He says this court must peek, have a peek into the grounds of review. And so one of the considerations by this court in order to determine whether or not to grant an interdict is prospects of success in the review. And so our argument in all four points that we make is that the prospect of success in part B are poor. And so that is why the amicus should be held in part A on the president's own argument. Because this court has to consider the process of success in part B. Other than that, there is nothing more Thank you. Thank you, Justice. Is there, is there any comment that any other council want to make on this issue? I, I need to clarify the, the instruction that my little friend conveyed that the President does not assist in a punitive course order in relation to all, both the litigant, the first respondent, and the attendants will be asking only for a party and party cost against uh, the first respondent. Mr. Hofo, anything you want to add? Yes, uh, Justices, yes. Now, uh, the uh, remarks by Mr. Mandacha do deal with my concern. I would have raised the issue of uh, the punitive cost order being raised in Part A itself as uh, one of the issues raised by the amicus. But once the concession is made, that uh, the cost order is You want to add anything, Mr. Matabedi? Nothing. No. So, I'm one. sorry, Justice. We are not making any concession that uh, the punitive cost of the issue is not relevant in relation to Part A. Yes. You know, my name is Mr. Bogos says he likes my concession, not his. Oh, yes. No, I, I've got the point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's just talk about this. taken a view uh, that uh, we should not hear uh, the Blockhouse Collective Foundation as an intervening party in Part A. Uh, that statement uh, does not in any way detract from any entitlement that that particular party has to participate in Part B. And I invite uh, 
uh, Mr. Ugwana's attorney to approach me with a view to arranging a consent order to admit uh, that party as an intervening party in Part B uh, once the appropriate arrangements have been made, either provisionally or finally to join the Minister of Justice so that the articulation of the debate which is fundamental to the intervening party's interest in the matter uh, can be properly dealt with. Thank you, Mr. Odwana. I'm sorry, Justice Sutherland. The point I forgot to make is in relation to the joint of the Minister, who would have noted both in the parties today and in our heads of our that we make it absolutely clear that we are not launching a constitutional attack. We are simply saying the court should consider those um, submissions that we made, not with a view to determining whether or not there has been a, there is constitutional invalidity, in specifically in relation to Section 7. So Very well. it will not be necessary for well. us to join the Minister well, of Justice. That, if, if you limit your contention to that, then it's correct. You won't need the Minister. Yeah. But um, obviously, um, that's one less arrow in your quiver. So that's that's a choice you make. Yes, Thank you. So, Mr. Mpofu. Hello there. Before the, we celebrate that, uh, with the Royal, uh, I, I will take those remarks as uh, applying to me because we do intend to raise that issue in front of Yes. Yes, good. Yes, good. Well, it seems that um, your pragmatism has been overtaken by Mr. Mpofu's yeah. zeal. Well, we took a view that the amicus will not care the way of all. No, I, I, I take that point. Can, can, I, can I make this preliminary observation? Um, I've said it twice already, so let me emphasize it now. Uh, there's, a, there's a great deal to be dealt with in this controversy. We are not going to trespass on the relief in Part B. Uh, that involves many very delicate issues which require to be dealt with unhurriedly and with reflection. Uh, the agenda for today is to determine whether or not there should be an interim interdict pending a date to be arranged for that hearing. After these proceedings, I will invite the parties to see me about the earliest possible date for that hearing to take place. And uh, the extent to which we need to hear argument today is limited to the issues which are relevant to the interim interdict. As I have them, other than some frills which I shall deal with presently, uh, the jurisdiction of this court to even consider this relief is point one. Point two is whether it's urgent. And the other four issues relate to the traditional elements of an interim interdict. That is what we need to hear argument on. Uh, we will give a judgment and order on that. And with such expedition as is prudent, uh, get to round two in this matter in due course. Uh, to that end, um, Although there was a very generous indication by one of the council about how many days this matter was going to take, uh, we are of the view that the issues are of such a nature that we can do justice to this matter if we give to the applicant um, 60 minutes to present its case, to the first respondent 90 minutes, uh, to the MPA uh, an opportunity to say hello, and uh, to the applicant uh, 20 minutes for a reply if one is needed. So that will be the agenda for the day. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, 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 I just wanted to, from that summary, my lord, I gather we recently, without saying is that uh, your lordships are not inclined to hear the uh, preliminary points regarding whether this court, as you correctly put it, should even be sitting here or whether the matter is urgent. 
uh, up front. Uh, am I correct in that? No, I, I do want to hear you on both those points and, and obviously what you have to say about the interim interdict yourself. So that seems to me to cover what needs to be dealt with today. So, so I appreciate the jurisdictional point is is a leading point you want to make, and I do want to hear you on that. You mean as a preliminary approach? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm asking whether the real question I'm really asking is whether we're going to have one stage or two stages. So we'll have one stage. Yes. Okay. Now, if we're going to have one stage, then uh, which I always support, subject to, of course, my right of reply on the preliminary points. Uh, which that's the one. Yes, yes, Thank you. In other words, on the, on the uh, points in the middle. Yes. Thank you. Right, let, let, let me deal with some points which are unworthy of consideration, which have been raised on the papers. Um, I deal with them in no particular order. There's a complaint raised about the clumsy commissioning of the founding affidavit. It was clumsy. Um, it is, in a sense, inexcusable, but it's the practice of this court um, not to take that kind of complaint seriously. And the fact that the affidavit has now been repaired by the commissioner giving the relevant information uh, is sufficient for us to overlook that point. The same thing goes for the omission of a case number. Uh, we take a similar view about the point raised about whether or not the security which the respondent, first respondent, was supposed to pay before the summons was issued was actually paid afterwards. Uh, we are not interested in that point either. Uh, to the extent that condemnation is required, uh, it will be granted in due course. Uh, there is also another point about whether the National Director of Prosecutions should have AO nominee been joined rather than the National Prosecuting Authority as a whole. We are not interested in that point either. And um, that, that really disposes of all the precious points. That leaves us to get to grips with uh, what the case is really about. So, at 10.28, Mr. Manecci, your 60 minutes begins. Yes, Lord, with the court's guidance, I shall deal first with the question of jurisdiction. <coughs> and then address the question of agency and the environment of interim. Just by way of the background, the trips issue raising is whether the, um, the private prosecution may be interdicted pending Part B, where in Part B the validity of the summons, in other words, the root of the yeah. prosecution itself is challenged. And, um, and we, sub we submit that on established authority, the, the High Court has power to grant relief which would prevent a private prosecution from being proceeded, either as final relief in the form of an interdict or by way of a review. And in those circumstances, the court had, has inherent jurisdiction to grant interim relief to prevent injustice from happening. That is brought out by this situation. And there is ample authority in the courts that that indeed can be, it's a power that this, the High Court can be. <clears throat> and we, and I take, I'll take my words to the, to the cases dealing with uh, jurisdiction, which we address in our heads of argument from page 11 test to, and, 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 and when I say, as we say in our heads of argument, the, what animates the application is really the rule of that the ability to prosecute private is a privilege granted on specific conditions, is not a power that is granted to private parties originally under the Constitution. Under the Constitution, the National Prosecuting Authority is the civil prosecuting authority. And the only time that a private party, <coughs> the private, privately prosecute, is if the NPA has considered the complaint, the particular complaint, against a particular suspect and has declined to prosecute. It's only in those circumstances. And all the other requirements for the private prosecution are met, then the private prosecution is lawful. 
But absent compliance with those conditions, the rule of law puts its face against the private prosecution mm -hmm. and courts are entitled to prevent mm -hmm. and to vindicate the rule of law, both in the interim and in the final interim. Mm -hmm. And I refer to cases starting from cases prior to our constitution. Indeed, the first case we refer to is a judgment of the, the, the transfer of the national division in Solomon. And, 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 and prior to that, we made a submission and I emphasize it, that jurisdiction is determined on the previous case. It's not determined on how one party understands the case of the other. It is what is the case that we're going to court. And we brought to court the case that the private prosecution fails to comply with the jurisdictional requirements of Section 6, 7 and 9 of the CPA. Now bear in mind what the court has said about Section 9. Can I just say it now, whereas the court has indicated that failure to comply with the security requirement is a matter that may be controlled, what we have before me, my lords, is confirmation by the applicant in the latest update that in fact security hasn't been paid. What was presented as an annexure to the summons reflecting proof of security is not in fact proof of security. What you are told is money has been set aside with the state with the attendees. It is reflected in the books of the attendees. Now, you're not taken into confidence by the attorney or the uh, no, I appreciate that. Yes, but, but I, I'm just prefacing is, it. Is, uh, obviously, if they don't fix it, by the time we get to part B, uh, that's a problem. But it's eminently fixable, and I don't really want to spend any time on it. Quite correct. All I'm saying is, a, is, a, is an additional point of clear, admitted mm -hmm. non-compliance that should weigh with the court in determining part A, because it may or may not be fixed. Mm -hmm. But we'll cross the bridge when we get to part mm -hmm. Coming back to the question of jurisdiction, so we quoted a paragraph 112 from the case. But of sorry, Mr. Manisha, if, if you're saying that in relation to part A, it needs to be taken into account, but I thought the order that was made, or the pronouncement which was made by my brother, was that it's something that can be fixed and it's a technical point that the court is not going to. Uh, Allah. I'll come back to you when I deal with, okay. the, with the question of compliance because we, we would submit it's not as straightforward as that from the case law that we've seen. And, and the court might need to reflect on it. It may still reach the same conclusion, but at least uh, he has part of that point. Now, the, the case of Solomon versus Magistrate Victoria, um, we submit, confirms that. The, a private prosecutor stands on a different footing from a public prosecutor because the ability to prosecute, the right to prosecute in the case of a private prosecutor arises from compliance with the statutory requirements of the Section 7 and 9 of the CPA. And absent compliance, the private prosecution is irregular and can be altered. And if I can take the, to the paragraph that we, 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 we quoted from, the actual judgment, which I, I have, and I have uh, so that the court can follow me, read from the judgment um, um, in, in Solomon. You, you, you loaded it to case lines in any of you. We have loaded it to case lines. Um, mm -hmm. So Solomon is at page 014-279. And there are two important remarks to make before dealing with that judgment is that it concerns um, a, a, a prosecution issued in the magistrate's court, so it's of an inferior court. <clears throat> but what the court clarifies there is that there's a power to interdict an irregular private prosecution and that it would really make no sense to suggest that the court, even if the, this was a prosecution in the high court, the high court would not be able to interdict conduct by its own officials like the registrar issuing a summons which is unlawful without the thing that we not been able to provide a remedy for that. And in the discussion, which you will see at page 014-280, and I point out that this is a judgment of the TPD for 1950 of Robert J. 
Then Mr. 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 Ma, Mr. Ma, Mr. Um, <coughs> you say it's 014 dash 280. Yes. Thank you, sir. Um, what you will see at the foot of the page, the paragraph saying, I can find in the sections relied upon no evidence. And the point there was to deal with the provisions of the uh, of the Criminal Procedure Act as it stood in 1917, which um, allows for the, the, the private prosecutor to take steps. And, and the argument was some of these provisions, including the provisions in the Criminal Procedure Act, exhaust the powers of the court to intervene and grant intervention where private prosecution is complained to be unlawful. And what the court says at the foot of that page is, I can find in the sections relied upon no evidence that the provisions relating to the cost of unfounded and vexatious prosecutions or the title of the prosecutor to bring the proceedings were intended by the legislature to be exhaustive and to exclude any right to invoke the assistance of the Supreme Court as the applicant now does. You recall that they argue that because you can raise the title of the prosecutor in the actual criminal proceedings, and you can get costs if those proceedings are unsuccessful. That means you must go there and raise your complaint there. You are in and around court. And the court says that can be, doesn't exhaustively exclude the jurisdiction of the court. And it says, Mr. Pratib maintained, I think in support of this contention, that the provisions referred to were exhaustive, that under section 17 and 18 of the Act, the private party who had obtained the Attorney General's certificate was given an absolute right to prosecute, of which he could not be deprived by the court. No doubt the sections referred to do bestow a right to prosecute subject to the necessary conditions. But I cannot take the view that that fact excludes the jurisdiction of the court to interfere on proper course. If Mr. Ratif's contention were correct, this court would have no power to intervene even though it were shown in the clearest possible manner that the party who had instituted the private prosecution had no interest whatever in the outcome of the trial and had embarked upon it for some ulterior motive. Such for example as to prevent a business competitor from leaving the country on his lawful business or to delay him in so doing. So clearly for an ulterior purpose. In such a case, if the prosecution were launched in the Superior Court, I do not consider that it could be held that the remedies provided in the sections of the Act to which Mr. Retief referred were exhausted. The taking out of the summons would clearly be an abuse of the process of the court in that it had been undertaken not with the object of having justice done to a wrongdoer, but in order to enable the prosecutor to harass the accused of fraudulent to defeat his rights. The process of the court provided for a particular purpose would be used not for that purpose, but for the achievement of a total of a totally different object, object namely for the oppression of an adversary. The court has an inherent, inherent power to prevent abuse of its process by frivolous of excessive proceedings. Um, and though this power is usually asserted in connection with civil proceedings, it exists in my view equally where the process of use is that provided for in the conduct of a private prosecution. <coughs> in the cases are postulated, therefore this court would in my mind, by virtue of its inherent powers, to set aside um, aside a criminal summons issued by its own officials or to interdict further proceedings upon it. It is also by virtue of its inherent power that the court interferes to restrain illegalities in inferior courts, either by way of interdict or mandamus or by declaratory order. And you'll see in the, in the paragraph just below the quotation, and uh, it says, it refers to Mr. Ratif, referred to Rex Mr. Deer, said that the right and duty of prosecution was absolutely under the control and management of the Attorney General. That was the submission. And so long as he complied with the provisions of the law with reference to prosecutions and trials, the court was not entitled to interfere. He argued that similarly, a private prosecution was absolutely under the different, under the different, sorry, under the control and management of the private prosecutor and that the court could not intervene. The case, Marudin may emphasize this point, Marudin, the case of the private prosecutor is, however, different from that of the Attorney General, in that the title of the former, either the private prosecutor, to prosecute is conditional upon his possession of such an interest as is described in the Act, and the court is therefore entitled to inquire into the question whether he has such an interest or not. So the civil court you know, can, um, can, can provide remedy, they can inquire into the issue whether this is a prosecution properly authorized under the uh, CPA section 7 and section 9. The next case I refer the court to 
is um, the Van der Venter judgment. That is 1996, and, and the court will find that at 014-285. And that is a judgment of a Cape provincial division and also concerns a private prosecution of a judge uh, on the basis that the private prosecutor perceived that the way in which the judge dealt with the, with the, with the matter uh, disclosed the offense. Does that, does that uh, case offer any further principle or simply, it, it simply another yeah, example yeah, of the same proposition? Yes. yes. Uh, what it does is it does go to the deposit and says at least 1,000 times was paid in that case uh, yes. as a deposit. But I, I take the court's uh, comment in this one. And the second, the, the third case what we, we offer is, is the Netco Bank Limited and another was Kibi Chan. Is a judgment of the Eastern Cape Division, judgment of Erasmus J, 2003, also dealing with a challenge to a private prosecution that was not inconsistent with the with the uh, with the uh, with the, uh, with the, with the, with the CPA. Just, and, just, just give the full reference while you. Yeah, the full it. reference. Um, so the, the the case line reference is 414-176, but the full reference is. Netco Bank Limited in Alaska. This is Kilichana, this GCI L I T S H A N A and others. 2004, one one, SA 232. And that also deals with um, uh, the question of powers of the High Court. And it says a paragraph. 27 of the judgment, which is at page 014-180. Ordinarily, this is dealing with the question of motive and whether it can feature in determining at a civil, at an, at an interdict stage, whether a prosecution should be permitted or not, how a prosecution is lawful or not. So that's between paragraph 27 and 014-180. Ordinarily, the reasons and motives of a party for institution legal proceedings are irrelevant. However, when the court finds an attempt made to use for attendant purposes machinery device for the better administration of justice, it is the duty of the court to prevent such abuse. But it is a power which has to be exercised with great caution and only in a clear case. The learned judge made the comment in the context of misuse of the rule of the court by one of the litigants. Uh, and first so on. The court held that it has the power to interdict a private prosecution which is irregular, vexatious, or an abuse of the process of the court. The power derives from the inherent jurisdiction of our superior court to prevent abuse of their process. Although such power will be exercised with caution and only in a clear case, the courts will not hesitate to act where necessary, lest the administration of justice attract discretion. The power shall be exercised in the light of all the relevant facts and circumstances and with due regard to the inter intention of the legislature as reflected in the statutory provisions, if any, pertaining to the particular proceedings. All right, I, I think we have the point, Mr. Yeah, well, I, I don't think you need to read all the case law, otherwise yes. you will gobble up all of your 60 minutes and, as the court quoting. Please. As the court pleases. And so the, what, the, what those judgments establish, and one of which is the judgment of this, uh, from, from, from this uh, division, uh, is that, well, I would be referred to Nunandal as well, which is to the same effect. Yeah. You recall in Nunandal, the court even said that a challenge to the validity of a summons or a certificate not a prosecute can be, should be brought under Rule 53. And parties are part of the certificate, paragraph 8 of the judgment. And the summons in that case, in other words, in that case, the summons were set aside in, in relation to security. Interesting, because they, better than here, they had been in fact an arrangement, an agreement between the parties, between the attorneys, that security shall be, uh, that an amount shall be retained by one of the attorneys to protect the, 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 the accused in the prosecution. But, but, the court, but, in, but in any event, uh, Nonadal deals with the challenge to the summons on the face of it, yes. not the nolly prosecuting. Uh, it, it, it dealt with both. It found that there was no ground for challenging the certificate, not in prosecute, but found that there was a basis yeah. for, for the non for the summons and set aside the summons and left the certificate. But the point I'm making is that the whole private prosecution in that case was invalidated on account of the fact that 
there, there are two there are two grants, the procedural grants and the court will find the discussion of that in at um, paragraph zero uh, page one zero one four page one nine nine at paragraph forty one to forty five. The first was there was no evidence presented that when the registrar the clerk issued the summons, uh, the certificate was presented to the clerk. So it was a procedural matter. The second was the security was not deposited prior to the summons being issued. And in the language of the statute, one that uh, the court doesn't have power to condone, and, and that is a defect, which can easily be rectified. But the court doesn't have to assist a prosecutor who comes to court firstly says, there are some there's an annexure proving security. When he's challenged on it, he gives uh, stories and only at the very last minute files an affidavit which he says, I haven't paid it. It is in the books of the attorney. And anyway, you have powers generally to, 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 to waive just because there's substantial compliance. How can, how can, how can a failure to comply at all be substantial compliance? Mr. Manager, I understand the point you're putting forward is that as a matter of principle, the court has got jurisdiction. Yes. The matters that you are addressing now are probably matters that should arise yes, yes. in the discussion on agency. Quite, quite. But uh, the, the only reason I was mentioning that is that Brunandal is also authority for the proposition that these challenges can be brought in the civil court. Because that was a review by the full, full bench, full bench, full court, I think they will try to clarify the, the nomenclature. But that's the point. So, the, so that's, if we establish as, uh, that in, in terms of these inherent powers, it can intervene by way of review, setting aside, or by way of granting a final meeting, stopping the private prosecution of the threats. And the only question I need to address is, well, if that is the case, um, is there power to grant interim relief pending either the review or the, or the, um, or the or a final interdict. And, and, the, and, the, and the job for me then with respect is, is a lighter one. Because once a power, once the court has a power to hear a, a review, the part B review, it has inherent power to grant pendant pen relief pending the outcome of that to preserve for, in the interest of justice, for the proper administration of justice in the control of its own process, but also to prevent any injustice from care. Because the injustice we complain about here is being hauled before the criminal court when the proceedings are at root, at root, are invalid. So they don't get out of the law, as we say in the, in, in the papers. It's a different matter with public prosecutions, which are pre presumptively they are lawful because there are no prior conditions. Once the prosecutor has applied his mind and believes that there's a criminal party case, prospects of success, they institute the proceedings, you must go and plead there. But none comes that. I hope that expresses the right expression. Well, that we, doesn't apply well we've, we've got your point. You, you say that on the strength of the authorities you cite, there's a clear basis for the court to be approached for this form of relief, yes. and they don't have to um, wait until they appear in order to plea, in order no, to raise it. We don't have to so that's the yeah, point. That, that page 011 43, we refer back to the well established authorities on the power, on the courts in hand passed to grant in And we refer to the AO Express judgment, which is well known judgment, regarding the licensing uh, and courts who are familiar with that. But it's clearly there is. And then there are s subsequent cases we refer to involving the current president and involving the former president Zuma, in which stay proceedings were obtained pending review proceedings, and the interest of justice were applied as the yardstick to determine whether interim relief should be granted. So the, the final proposition we make, my, my Lord, is that there is established authority. We haven't seen authority to the contrary, other than authorities raised in the context of public prosecutions. And uh, in the context of private prosecution, there is authority, there is a power, and if there is a power to grant final relief, there is a power to grant it. Very well. Then the next point I need to address my words on is the question of agency. And in, in addressing it, well, we've addressed it in our heads that... Um, well, well perhaps, perhaps you can start by simply formulating. The, the point. As, as of today, what is the fact that 
that demonstrates the urgency you rely on? Yes, there are two points. The primary point is that the, the criminal proceedings will sit on the 19th of January next month. And the, the private prosecutor has indicated no intention whatsoever of postponing or removing from the role because that is competent. In Van Deventer, you will see there was agreement and the, the private prosecution was removed from the role and the matter ultimately set before court in the ordinary course. But it was not only the ordinary course, agently because there were some changes about keeping to the agreement. But the point of it is the private prosecutor will not budge. He will not remove the matter from the law on the 19th of January. He wants the president to appear in that court as an accused and plead. He says, go there and raise all of his complaints. That pregnant in that statement is accept the breach of your constitutional rights, of your rights for protection in terms of the rule of law, that you're not in, no one is entitled to hold you before a criminal proceeding, private criminal proceeding, when the provisions of section 7 and 9 have not been complied with. <coughs> now, my client has no other remedy to avoid that. It, it will happen on the 19th, and that breach of his rights, by being all before that court, remaining in attendance, we cannot be reversed. So it's not a case where we can wait till next week and get a remedy or some other time and get a remedy that will, uh, that will substantially assuage his uh, rituals. That's done. And, and you'll see in Van and we go to now. But they're, they're saying that you have a right to go before that court and plead to that. And that seems to me an alternative. <laughs> My lords, so the courts have said that a substantial remedy that you're talking about is a remedy one can obtain in law. So the law provides you protection. Now when he says, go to that court and plead, you have a right. Of course we have a right to go to that court. But we also have a right to assert our constitutional rights and say we cannot be held before a unlawful private <coughs> criminal proceedings. We have those rights. And my client has decided to accept the right that this is entitled to approach the court to protect him from being, from having his rights trampled upon by a private prosecutor who prima facie, and that's the case we have today, prima facie is conducting an unlawful private prosecution. It's not only really unlawful for the submissions we're going to make on the non-compliance, which I'll do in a minute. The non-compliance has significance for the constitutional scheme as well. Because if we can persuade my lords that the non-prosecution certificate that he relies on, on his own facts and on the chronology that he gives, cannot relate to the crime committed by the president after the 21st of August 2021. Well, you're, you're on to arguing what the prima facie right is composed of. Yes, so the prima facie right, um, I'm digressing quite right. The kind of like right is to be protected against a private prosecution that breaches the rule of law, breaches his constitutional rights. He's got an inherent, he's got a constitutional guarantee under the constitution that his freedom of movement, his, 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 uh, his liberty and all of those rights cannot be infringed by a private prosecutor acting illegally as this private prosecutor is doing. That's the first issue. The well, well let, let, let's, let's just uh, focus in on the critical bit. Um, one can say it in many ways, but fundamentally what you're saying is the personal freedom of the applicant is being jeopardized by <coughs> a prosecution, uh, by a prosecutor that has no title to do so. Right. So that, that's the right. Um, why, 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 why is that? an appropriate formulation of the right to lie. One of, one of the contentions advanced by the first respondent is that um, every inhabitant of the country, uh, if charged with a crime, um, has an obligation to uh, submit to that and come to court and say whatever they want. So when you say, <coughs> I have a right not to be brought to court at all. 
uh, what, uh, what, what, where exactly do you seat that right? In the Constitution, in the common law, where do we find it? Okay. Perhaps I should, I should uh, uh, add some meat to the proposition mm. I made. Mm. So, he's got the right to hold before court in a private prosecution not authorized by the, uh, by Section 7 and Section 9 of the Security. Because that is the only source of the power that uh, the prosecutor can, can, can exercise. That's the only power the prosecutor can exercise. It must be it must meet those conditions. So it's not just a general right that every individual enjoys in respect of public prosecutions. And that's why even the cases I referred to my words to make a clear distinction each time that the position of a private prosecutor is different from the position of a public prosecutor. So one can make the point that if the right authority, the NPA, has issued a summons to you to appear criminally in the court, uh, all the conditions are met, and whatever defense is raised. But in a private prosecution, the position is different because you don't get out of the seven block as a private party to get into court. I, I, I'm trying to think of an analogy that can come up even in a public prosecution. Assuming that the Constitution tells us the civil prosecuting authority is the NPA you were judged by the NIA and told to go to the So any other authority outside of the NPA, and it was so obvious that this is not a constitutional prosecution, it's not a lawful, legal, nothing, there is no legal foundation to it. We would submit, although we are not there, even we are less than that position, that even in that case, it would be hard not to foresee a situation where the civil courts can be approached to prevent Clear, clear British of the Constitution, the constitutional So, So your point is this, if I am in terms of the Constitution vested with rights of freedom, should the state prosecute me, that's an intrusion on my rights of freedom, but it's lawful because it's authorised. Yes. And if a private prosecutor wants to intrude on my freedom, it can only do so within the four corners of a nolly prosecutor. So, so, so if, if you had um, a proper case to challenge the validity of the nolly prosecutor, then that author authorization of the private prosecutor would evaporate. Yes. Well, so it, it might be a defect that affects the summons because there is something wrong with the nolly, yeah. but it might be a defect in the summons itself, either in the manner in which it was obtained or the conditions attended to its obtaining is not consistent with this section 19 of the so Well, well what, what, what plausible contentions exist on your argument to doubt that this nolly prosecui uh, doesn't vest the first respondent with authority to bring the applicant before a criminal court. Yes. Um, just before that, I don't want to forget that I was going to put a second element to my agency. I beg your pardon. Yes. So, we, we, the, the first respondent says, well, your agency was in relation to the ANC conference, mm. and that is common goal. But what he doesn't acknowledge, which we have referred to in our heads in the reply, is that the step aside rule, in fact, continues to apply. So if he is hauled before the criminal court, those of his detractors in the organization, including for present purposes, um, in this context, the first respondent will say, well, then, now you are criminally before court. Now you must step aside. But you step aside not only from your NC position, you step aside from the national position as president. So the, the impact is not just on the immediate interest of the president, but it transcends into the interest of the public. Yes. So that's the agency point. And I know it's not a basis for agency also, but the, our little friends and his, his team and his clients say this is a very important issue. <coughs> this board cannot leave us with no answer whether we can come for assistance mm. and whether we can come for assistance agent. Mm. I accept that in that course the court will decide when it's agent or not. But everybody has put in their papers, we are here, we are arguing the matter. There is no utility 
to justice, the administration of justice, or to the public interest, to simply say we're not deciding the matter because of that. This is the kind of case we submit in the public interest and in the, on the basis that everything is before this court, that the court must make a determination on whether this court is empowered to assist litigants in these kinds of positions. And especially when the... Well, it, it seems to me, the, but isn't that a proposition that goes to harm? You, you, you say, um, I'm harmed because my personal freedom is being intruded upon. And secondly, I hold a public office which is immediately threatened once I submit to a prosecution. That, that's the harm aspect. Yes, I, I, I accept that. Mm. But as we refer to the judgment uh, in Bidvest, mm. that um, the utility of an interdict, of an interim interdict, and the presence of agency are it's intertwined. intertwined. And so that is when even the considerations and the requirements for interim interdict are relevant to determining agency because if we make out a case that cries out for an interim interdict and the court simply says we would have helped you for 100 reasons but sorry he's not agent then we submit that's not a proper exercise of that discretion to determine matters on an agent basis so now what we submit and we've dealt with this question of agency in a greater detail and i just wanted to refer the court to the funding funding uh, fenty judgment which just to the point we just debated in our uh, um, that um, in that court, um, the, the fact of the pending criminal prosecution which was not going to be removed from the hall was held by the court to manifestly show that the matter is urgent. Because what could the accused do? No, nothing. He had to sit. He had to, in a sense, submit himself to the breach of his rights as a restaurant. What is the case line reference, Mr. The, the case I refer to is Van Dierventer. Um, this is Van Beck, is R E I C H E N B E R and another. And on case line? It's 014 285. And um, I'm asking for my. Oh, yeah. You'll find the passage at 014 <coughs> and it's the third paragraph from the foot of the page where the court deals with agents. Uh, uh, just reading from the paragraph just about that, the, the judge says, and this is uh, uh, Justice um, that was written by JP, he says, in his answering affidavit, the first respondent disputes that the matter is agent. However, on 13 November 1995, the first respondent agreed to an order in terms whereof the matter was postponed for hearing on 4 December 1995. But he persisted in his argument that the matter is devoid of any agents. So the hearing date was coming, 4 December. I'm satisfied that this application is indeed manifestly one of agents. That is, that it has properly been brought as such and that the court is in terms of rules 612 entitled to dispense with the prescribed time periods. The applicant is called upon to appear in the criminal court on 21 December 1995. If this application had been brought in the ordinary course, it would not have been heard before then, and in all likelihood, it would only have been heard in the course of the second term of 1996 at the It is quite clear that the applicant would therefore not be able to attain the interest at an ordinary just, 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 okay. just pause for a moment, Ms. Minechi. Our technology is interfering with us again. Is this an electricity problem? Well, apparently the recording device has malfunctioned. Uh, but let's carry on in any Yes. So I was just reading that point about, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if the court wants me to repeat the No, don't, don't do that. We've got that. We've got the point. Yes. So that's the judgment. Um, so we recently that that is a, a salutary um, application for the principle. And I tend to the question, my oh, the, the second point about criticism on agency, of course, is that he should come uh, on the 16th or on, on, the, on the holiday because he was concerned about the action. Of course, the, the point is, the, 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 as you say, the, 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 the risk continues that the step aside uh, yes. is there. And secondly, he, he genuinely asked the, uh, the 
That's just one to withdraw the summons. Explain what the problems were with the first summons of the 15th of December. There was a conditional offer to withdraw and reissue in order to cure the defects that we identified. And when the first response, the applicant said, no, withdraw unconditionally because there are incurable defects, then the applicant, the first respondent, issued the second summons on the 21st of December. And it was clear now that the applicant has to come to court. And the applicant came to court. Six days during the festive season, a then friend complained to me about disturbing his holiday. We know what happens during the festive season. It's not easy to match a legal uh, representative to put together an exit application. But the best was done and sufficient time was, was granted. And in the event, the court granted directives which allowed for a better time for the exit papers. Now, going to the requirement today to the question about the anomaly. Uh, so the, the, sorry, Mr. Manager, the withdrawal of the issuing of the second summons, doesn't that tantamount to a withdrawal of the first? And, well, and therefore rectifying the defect that you were complaining about? Well, if, if that was what the, the, the first respondent said, maybe I would accept that. But the first respondent doesn't say that. It says you must be accumulating. Them together. Yes, he, he does say it's a supplementary yes. thing. Yes. Well, you know, once again, um, as my brother says, if you issue a summons in identical terms, amplified, there might well be a proper case for an implicit withdrawal of the first, just to make things tidy. But um, that seems to be to be a quibble that uh, uh, yeah, no, doesn't I'm deserve our attention. I'm not worried about that point. It's in the papers. Yeah. Okay. So you can go to this substantive yes. one. And that is uh, what we address in our heads uh, at page sorry, uh, 011. Uh, 011 that we, we address the compliance issue at different places. And I'm going to give the board with both references in the heads. So the, the first reference in the heads you will find in the law at, at page 011-8 starting from paragraph 14 and that carries on to um, to page 011-12 and then we return to that point again um, I'm just trying to get my page numbers Later in the, after dealing with agency, we come back to the language of the section at page 01 31, and that carries on to the um, places. Carries on to um, yes, uh, to page. Uh, one, zero, one, 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 one. So succinctly, so the way we understand, and we might have misunderstood the case and they can correct us, is that they say they rely on both the non prosecute certificate of the 6th of June and the non prosecute certificate of the 21st of November 2022. And we also will find those certificates in the papers So if 
if the court is at the 6th June uh, certificate, it's a different place. There's another one at 001 113. <coughs> You'll see um, at the, if, if the court is at that certificate, I just want to go. You'll see the certificate in terms of section 72 of the Act. I, Zungu, duly appointed director, public prosecutions, Kozumi Natal, be by certified that I've seen all the statements and affidavits on which the charge particularized below is based, and that I decline to prosecute at the balance, at the instance of the statement. So if the charge particularized below, and you will see how the charge is particularized. First is the suspect, William John Downer, the chief down the seat. Then the complainant is the Mr. Zuma, and the alleged crime is a contravention of section 416, right, 417 of the National Prosecutive Authority Act, 32 of 1996. And then there's the date of the alleged crime, which is 9 August 2021, and then you have a police reference number, which is a Peter Maris reference number. So it is about a specific suspect, about a complaint, uh, a less crime committed on 9 August 2021, and the crime is particularized. And that is the unauthorized disclosure of confidential information. The president made the allegations against the president. No offense in the summons is not the one that the president disclosed confidential information. Is that he is an accessory after the fact and or just in respect of this primary offense. So that's the first certificate. The second certificate you will find at 001 166, that's the primary one. And, and you will see from the papers, and now the, 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 the recent update filed overnight, and it gives you the chronology in the Marisburg case in relation to this morning. And you will see that what they say is, when they initially issued summons against Ms. Moon, they relied on the June certificate. Ms. Moon said, but that only relates to Mr. Downer and not to me. Then they wrote back to the National Constitutional Authority and said, issue another certificate or whatever, amend or amend or do whatever you can to cover everyone who reached 416 and 417, even accessories after the fact. Uh, we ask you to do that. But just make me understand, I mean, for my sanity. Um, how does this, for the purposes of agency, affect a crime that would have been committed on the 21st of August? I mean, I, I don't understand. Because if I look at the certificate, the date of the crime is the 9th of August. Does that relate to the applicant? Ah, yes, it does. So, yes. Uh, so, um, so, well, they say it does. So yes, yes, I just wanted to understand. So they say this certificate relates to the applicant. So they took, they used this certificate yes. to issue summons in December 2022 against the applicant. Then the reason they do that is they say, well, this second certificate, forget the context that it was requested to deal with their problems facing this Mourn's prosecution. They say, well, because the certificate says prosecute any person in connection with this matter, that means even though on the, the president only comes in because on the 21st of August 2020. 25th. 20, 21st, yeah. yeah. I just wanted to show you. They, are, they wrote him and said, Mr. Downer and the prosecuting team had chose not to accept medical reports coming from the military hospital. And Mr. Manager, yes. do you understand why I was asking? I don't understand. Yes. Just help me understand. Yes. Can I can I try that? Yes. So our our primary submission is that none of these two certificates yes. relate to the president. They relate, firstly, this relates to Mrs. Mr. Downer, the June certificate, and the correction or the expansion of the certificate in November 2022 also relates to people who committed a crime on the 9th of August 2021, because that's what the certificate says. 
So it says uh, you must uh, refuse to. Uh, so let me just read. I, the name Zoom, who duly appointed director of public prosecutions, pass in the town, hereby certify that I have seen all the statements and affidavits on which the church particularized the law is based, and that I decline to prosecute any person in connection with this matter at the instance of the state. You're still on the church that did particularize the law. And that church that particularized the law is where the complainant is Mr. Zuma, what you don't have anymore is a suspect. They've removed the suspect because they want to catch everyone. But that's not good enough to catch the president because they still tell me that the alleged crime, the particular, particular charge relates to the contravention of 417. That is the disclosure. And the president is not accused of disclosure. They go further and they tell you the date of the alleged crime is the 9th of August of 2021. It's not a date later than the last one was doing. But Mr. Manager, in as far as the applicant is concerned, my understanding is that the complaint is based on accessory after the fact. Yes. So just help me also understand because they're saying you failed to deal with the offenses committed under uh, Section 4 by the two other accused. Yes. So the, the question, the rhetorical question we ask is where in this certificate do you get the impression that the DPP was considering the president's failure to investigate this contravention, and it is that failure that makes him accessible. But isn't it the, 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 they would then argue that the debt in reading the formulation in the uh, certificate itself, any other person? Well, but you can't. As the courts have said, numerous times that you mm. don't yes, you don't take any person, put it on the chalkboard and read it and give it meaning. You read it in context. The context here of the certificate, before you get to the background, which I will show you, that even that is against the, the, the first responder. The, 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 the certificate tells you that the charge is particularized people, firstly. And then you propose that there could be more than Mr. Dana who disclosed population information without the authority of the MD. So that, that might be a potential in this. But the way they help you understand who it relates to is they tell you the charge is contravening section 417, firstly, and that crime, that contravention was committed on land holders to the so you would have to find that the president was an accessory after the fact on 9 August 2021, and therefore this certificate covers it. No, we've got your point. Yes, you, and the chronology you, you, says no. You say in, in, any, any person has its own problems, but assuming it could include the applicant, yes. um, the DPP has identified a time, place and offence Yes. which can't relate to what has been alleged in the summons. That's your point. Which, which they say, they say in the answering of the they say that the alleged, the alleged offence of accessory after the fact occurred after 25 years. Yes. So they just place it outside of the certificate on their own version. Well, accepting for the moment your proposition on that, uh, why, why can't the Nolly Prosecuti be read purposively to implicitly include any person who um, was involved, let me use that as a neutral word, uh, without going to the petty bureaucratic detail of having to spell out other dates and, and, and other competent verdicts on, on what is the principal crime. It seems to me that's, that's the thrust of the first respondent's case, yes. is that it's a, it's a petty interpretation you make of the nolly to, to treat it in an unduly literalist fashion. Yes. So there, there are two points to me. Is my, my lord, the, the question put to me, uh, Justice Sutherland, is a sound one. But it will still be limited by the other contents of the certificate. So if any person is involved in the matter, but involved as a line August 2021, you can't have any other person involved on the 25th of August 2021. That's the first point. 
But the second and more fundamental point is that the reason why one places a strict meaning to a non prosecutor it's the kind of power that you unleashes against a private citizen in the hands of another private citizen. You are now exposed to potential harassment by an, a private party who may be motivated by private interests in proceeding with the private prosecution. Well, that, That's may, why that, may, be, that may be so. That may be so. But let's just look at the Nolly more carefully. Um, can it plausibly be argued? that the applicant is not implicated in the crime of 9 August, notwithstanding the fact that the actus reus of which he is accused to have perpetrated occurred at a later time. Yes, he uh, can't be accused of being involved in 9 August. He was not even aware of the commission of the crime on 9 August. And the commission of the crime was completed at that time the only time he becomes informed of this is in the letter of Mr. Sumau to the first of August asking him to investigate. Even the investigation is about particular matters. It's to investigate how, as he puts it, to investigate the ethics of the conduct of his uh, prosecutors or officers of the court. And what the president does on the 25th of August, he doesn't ignore this. He says, if I explain to the president, to him, he says, this is a very serious matter. I'm referring this to the Minister of Justice because it is the Minister of Justice that is responsible, that they have oversight, jurisdictional authority over the ADA. And I'm referring it to the LBC because you are also indicating professionals in private practice. Mm -hmm. So the president does something. Immediately, in fact, there will be argument about whether you can ever get a conviction when the president took steps of that crime. And remember, the president is not uh, an authority that investigates crime under our constitution. Can you imagine if any minister can receive a request to investigate crime and they is dropping in your telephone calls and investigating crime? They are authorities that the constitution says are the law enforcement agencies that investigate crime. And this is a, a, a person who was himself a president. He knows it. Even as president, he couldn't investigate crimes. How could he say that he asked the president to investigate crime? And when the president took steps, that in the taking of those steps, just because there hasn't been an outcome, the president is an accessory or has defeated the ends of justice. All right, we've got the point. And so, the so, point related yeah. to that, I'm uh, no, sorry <laughs> to interrupt you, carry on. Is that there is something unsound in the request, if it is to investigate a crime. Because this very crime is before the criminal courts. They are prosecuting Mr. Dauna and they are prosecuting Ms. Mon. How does the president, in parallel to the courts, investigate a crime? That's just unsound. I don't, it's unsound, it can never constitute a crime. And it's the same kind of reasoning the constitutional court has said about the exercise of powers by the public protector. So, so, so you, you've, you've, got, you've got these several criticisms which will be the subject matter of part B. Yes. You, you say that there's enough plausibility in it to afford you an opportunity to be heard then. Yes. And we should interrupt the prosecution in the meantime. Yes, that's what we're saying. We're not saying determine finally that we are right. We're saying that on a prima facie level, it is. And, and just to understand the context I just submitted, in the heads of argument for the, for the first responding at page 0, 0, at 011, page 112, at paragraph 42, they rely on the statements that were presented to the DPP to show that the president is also a suspect. But the, all that it says, you'll see that what it says, sorry, Oh, they say they quote from a police affidavit which is saying that is proof that the president was mentioned in the affidavits. And it says, I drink up all of the above on the 21 October 2022. The first respondent made a criminal complaint at the Pitamarasi police station. He's a, and the chronology starts from behind and you can look at the He submitted the detailed affidavit sitting on the second. That affidavit he attached among others the letter he had written to the president and his response. The following is said in the police affidavit which forms part of the police document. He says the alleged conduct also forms part of a separate investigation which 
which are conducted by the President of the Republic of South Africa, Mr. Martins. The relevant complaint letter came from the President of Apples and Mr. Spence from part of the Free Papers and the which are all to supplement my plea. Well, what, 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 that, that's what paragraph 17 and 18. Yeah. Why do you say that isn't sufficient to bring the applicant within the ambit? Uh, because what, all it says to you is that the applicant is investigating. It's not saying we have a complaint against the applicant at all. It just says we've complained to the applicant to investigate. They are they're showing confidence in the applicant investigating. They're not complaining against the applicant, which could form the subject matter of the charge. So that, that's really the point on the ignoring. Mr. Mr. Manager, just while you are there, and I know that uh, uh, my brother has told us that we shouldn't traverse or even trespass on the merits. Is it possible for an official of the state to be charged criminally, that is, for not doing anything about a complaint? We think it's not a crime, and that we will submit in part B, that this is a frivolous prosecution. Even if it, the president would be guilty of not performing his constitutional obligations diligently, there's a section in the constitution, 239 or 2381, that's all. We could complain about that, but we, we can't criminally prosecute him for failing to perform his function. I think the entire government will probably be involved. Thank you, sir. Well, we're we're all concerned with that when the lights go out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and the point you, 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 you just take a quick peek as the constitutional court says in in the and you will see that our complaints are valid. If our complaints are valid at a prima facie level, it means that there was no knowledge <coughs> money that was presented to the registrar to issue a summons. And a, a, a valid money is a prerequisite for, for the summons. So there's no private valid legal legally sound private prosecution. Well thank you. It's time for you to wrap up Mr. No, I'm, I'm wrap up. So in relation to the to requirements, is it clear right? I know the court is not interested in this security, but if you do get into that and look at Munandara, that's the clearest admission of a breach of the CDA. But there is a clear fact of breach in respect of the money certificate in the summons. And there is no alternative remedy. The balance of convenience favour the applicant. Mr. Suma, if he succeeds in Pakistan, will continue with his private prosecution. He will suffer prejudice. Um, and, and, and so we submit this the case may have for relief. The outer principle doesn't apply as regards Mr. Suma. He is not a public official performing public functions or exercising yeah. statutory powers. He is just taking advantage of a benefit that the statute creates for him to prosecute another private citizen. So we are we we, are, we submit we, we come home on the on, on the security test. In any event, if this was an exceptional case, this is an exceptional case because uh, on the face of it, the certificate is clearly not applied to him. He must be uh, prosecuted unlawfully before the uh, and the court should step in to prevent the injustice from occurring. So those are our submissions, and what we will ask in the notice of motion is to ask for prayer 2.1 just against the first respondent and prayer 2.2 to the extent that the court uh, finds it necessary to go that far, we submit that once 2.1 is granted, criminal prosecution comes here. And we don't uh, specifically in the court excuse me. And we only ask for costs on the part scale of use this one. Is any reason why the cost shouldn't be reserved for the part B be decided? It is in the court's discretion. Thank you, Mr. Manager. We'll, we'll take a brief adjournment now and come back. It's, um, we'll, the court will resume again at um, 11.45.